Greetings Podcast listeners. In this episode of All Things Thor, Tom shares with us the beginnings of his career as an Imagineer. This is a story so great, it's going to take more than one episode to fully cover. So let's get things rolling with part one. Grab a cup of eggnog or your seasonal beverage of choice and have a listen to Tom as he takes us on a journey into imagination on all things Thor. Okay, so here's another podcast directly from uh, from me, from my heart, and from my uh, recollection. And let me uh, kind of say that anything I say on these podcasts are things that are direct recollection recollections according to my um, experiences not to judge anybody or anything or any corporation or any anything I'm just kind of spilling my guts and sharing you um, the experiences that I had and uh, uh, you know that's about as uh, transparent as I can be. So, so what I'm going to start about today is my my experiences and how I got involved with being a Walt Disney Imagineer. And it was in 1995. And I don't even want to count the years because it seems like it was last week. But in 95, I was the director of attraction development for Universal Studios Hollywood. And I had just got through being involved in the design of the Waterworld live action show uh, and a number of other things. The Waterworld show is actually still going today, remarkably. Um, Even though most people don't even know what the inspiration was or the movie or the movie didn't even do that wonder wonderfully the Kevin Costner uh, a movie with uh, Waterworld being the theme anyway so at that time guys like me um, who were concept designers and show designers that were highly trained were at great demand and I was fortunate enough that the Disney company um, had a bunch of new projects that were just launched. They had just let a bunch of people go, which I didn't know about, that they were involved in. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but probably Euro Disneyland and a bunch of other things. And so, little did I know about the uh, sort of mindset of a lot of the people up there. You know, they a new guy coming along w- w- was not particularly welcome. Um, at least that's what they told me later on until they got to know me. And um, so... To make a long story short, I wasn't happy at Universal. Um, I was a director who got further and further away from being on the board and creating things and was more and more involved in directing other talent. And uh, that's not what I wanted to be, you know. I wanted to be um, in the... I wanted to be drawing and conceptualizing and doing all the things that I have done since I was five. And, uh, it was unfulfilling. And I, and the, at that time, the vice president of attraction development had a lot of faith in me and, uh, no one ever said I didn't do a great job at what I did. But I was very unhappy as the director of attraction development for Universal Studios in Hollywood. And um, 
it got me to thinking and I was like, I don't know how old I was, probably 32, maybe. And um, so I thought, okay, um, you know, um, geez, you know, um, what should I do? I mean, I've got all this background. I had had 10 years of experience in entertainment design. I had been a director and a manager of creative uh, talent as well as someone who was creating on my own attractions and and different things. So, um, anyway, I was given this opportunity, and Disney wanted me on board, and they made it very clear that they had a new project called Tokyo Disney Seas, which was one of the highest funded and... uh, exciting projects they had had in decades and they wanted me to take on um, the role of creating several e-ticket attractions and so of course it was you know I guess you can say it was a no-brainer I mean I wanted to do this Uh, who wouldn't want to be uh, a, a a person who supported the the dreams and the legacy of Walt Disney, and that's what I thought it was. You got to remember, I hadn't worked for the company other than for the Disney stores. I shared the story about Leota and things like that, but I hadn't been an Imagineer yet, and so I had no idea how it was structured or how things happened or anything like that. So my vision of the whole thing was quite full of, as many um, Disney veterans will say, pixie dust, quote, unquote. Um, I thought it was still like Walt designed it. And uh, I, I thought I would feel the same experience when I went into Imagineering. And I was beyond excited so I let my um, the vice president know that I'd like to move out of this position that I wasn't happy I don't think I even gave him exact reasons and um, looking back on it I probably should have been even more honest and said you know I've got an offer that I can't refuse and I'm not happy here in this position, blah, blah, blah. But at that time, I just um, said, you know, I need to I need to uh, remove myself from this. And so I did. And I was immediately hired by Walt Disney Imagineering as a director um, and the principal concept designer. And uh, so, well, I didn't know this, but um, I mean, I was welcomed immensely by all of them. Um, the, my portfolio was uh, reviewed by Marty Scalar and uh, other vice presidents and other executives, and they all said, yeah, we, we, we definitely want this guy on board. But... Um, I didn't know what a lot of the uh, other Imagineers had been through in the last few years, you know, with projects and where there was layoffs and some of their friends were laid off and everything. So, he, you know, I'm like the new guy on the block that is the first person hired in a long time. And I didn't realize it, but there was a lot of... Um, people who did <laughs> who didn't like me they didn't like the fact that who this guy was that came out of nowhere and was suddenly so um coddled by uh, imagineering and that's you know was the beginning i was ignorant of it um they did a big write up in the in the in the little uh, 
Gazette, the the Disney um, publication that was insider um, kind of a news thing that all the Imagineers got. And they said, here, you know, we're introducing our newest Imagineer, Tom Thordarson, director of attraction development for Universal Studios, and blah, blah, blah. You know, with pictures and the whole thing. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I just went along with it. As I went to the little place um, that was a few hundred yards away from me to get my Disney director with a slash um, that was a sign of uh, being somebody that was that was a uh, an officer or executive whatever you want to call it um, on my ID it had an orange band through it and it said uh, you know my name and my picture and then I got my name tag of course the ones you guys most are familiar with that said Tom you know with a little picture of Mickey Mouse with his imaginary hat in the upper right hand corner and so um, suddenly I was wearing this and becoming an Imagineer and uh, immediately um, the project that was the hottest project that ta- that time and most uh, funded um, was called Tokyo Disney Seas. And it was amazingly... The team was amazing, I have to admit. When I came on board and saw the talent, it blew my freaking mind at the talent that was there. The capabilities, some of which were multi-decade Imagineers that had been there. Others, a little bit less. But uh, nonetheless, this was the A-team. And I was blown away at the fact that these guys had any faith in me at all to do what I was about to do. Which was to create an e-ticket attraction for one of the highest funded and most promising Disney theme parks in the world. And uh, it didn't really fully resonate with me. Um, I think the thing that resonated me with the most, the most is probably that the fact that they said, you know, there have been some Imagineers that have kind of tinkered with some of the rides that you're going to be dealing with, but you can take what you want from what they've done. But more importantly is that we want you to do whatever you think is going to make this a mind-boggling experience. We want your take on it, your style. And uh, you can imagine any of any of you how uh, exciting, yet on the same hand, extremely intimidating this was. Because it was like a holy kit, you know. I have to... I have to really be on top of my game. And... Uh, Yet I'm excited as hell, and I'm gonna I am going to blow these people away, no matter what it takes. And so um, they gave me this really cool office um, in the Maple Building. The Maple Building at Disney Imagineering once was where all the animatronics were being created. Um, People I knew, the old uh, old timers, used to say that's where the pirates and moments with Mister, um, I mean, with uh, you know, um, great moments with Mister Lincoln and uh, all kinds of things were created. Um, the animatronics were created there, and uh, all kinds of exciting things that you guys 
or all of us, including me, would um, say, wow, is this where all that stuff was made in this building? And I had this office that was like, um, it was a beautiful office, a big office, you know? It was like 15 or 20 feet by 10 or 15 feet. And there was a glass window that overlooked the entire center of the Mapo building interior. So you could see what was going on down below. And uh, um, I, <laughs> I, you know, I have to say, I felt very blessed and blown away. And um, so I... I was drawing constantly, so the whole, every single square inch of that place was loaded full of sketches and drawings all over the walls. I mean, they were pasted all over the walls. I had sculptures of the characters I was working on for my first attraction, which was Journey to the Center of the Earth for Tokyo Disney Seas, as well as um, several other attractions for... Mysterious Island, which was one of the central um, features of Tokyo Disney Seas. And um, I was exploding with creativity. I mean, I was drawing like mad, uh, exploding with ideas. And uh, I uh, presented these ideas all the time. You know, the way it works there is that, you know, you create these ideas. And in this case, I had nobody else to work with. I had no writer, no anybody. Um, it was just me. I had to come up with a story. I had to come up with the style, the imagery, the... And then um, represent it in the form of drawings and sculptures and um, inspirational paintings that I had to present to upper management. So it was, you know, a serious gig. I remember this one time, it was so funny, because Michael Eisner was um, very uh, involved at that point. And uh, my window, as I said, um, on one side overlooked the central quad that lo uh, looking down below um, where everyone entered and there was a big giant model of the layout of Tokyo Disney Seas and uh, I saw Michael Eisner walk in I had to do a pitch a number of times to him but I remember seeing him walk in and I remember thinking Hey, there's Michael Eisner. Um, you know, um, I think my first thought was that he was going to be in like this $5,000 um, Italian suit, you know, um, walking in there with an entourage of other executives behind him. And he had a couple people with him. But, you know, when he came in, he was extremely casual. Um, I want to, I think I remember him, he had like a baseball cap on. And I don't know. I can't remember what else he was wearing because I'm not that type of person who pays attention to what people wear. But, you know, it wasn't anything trying to impress anybody. Might have been a warm up outfit. I mean, not warm up outfit, but I'm like, you know, like a. A Disney uh, brand uh, sweatshirt and a pair of jeans or slacks or something. I don't, I don't remember. But he comes, he comes wandering in, and uh, I look out my window. I look down at him. He looks up at me. He doesn't know who the hell I am. And I thought, oh boy, I guess this is the real deal. You know, I'm gonna be trying to sell my thoughts, my idea, my take on this. I hope this guy doesn't think I'm absolutely full of crap. And, you know, this is part of um, 
I think what we all, I mean, at least I experienced. I've never been so overconfident about what I can do that I think that everyone's going to be impressed by it. I usually think, okay, this is what turns me on. This is what I'm excited by. And I cross my fingers and say a prayer and I say, I hope to God that this flies. I hope someone else finds this, that it resonates in their heart and in the, and everything else as much as it's me, who I've always considered a 12-year-old kid in a man's body. Um, and in some cases, when I was at Universal, in most cases, I'll be honest with you, that didn't work. That didn't work. Um, the, uh, it was bottom line stuff. It was like, how much is this going to cost? How much are we leveraging um, intellectual property that we already have? Um, you know, they weren't as interested in my original ideas. That's part of why I left the company. Um, doesn't mean they're a bad company. It just means that um, I wasn't a good fit. And so I was concerned that this might be a repetitive situation here at Disney. Because I wasn't copying anything. Um, I, these are my own ideas, you know. Uh, loosely, loosely, and I mean really loosely, um, inspired by Jules Verne's book, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and a rather B or C rated movie with Pat Boone um, called Journey to the Center of the Earth. And so I had to make all this stuff up in my style and in my interpretation. And um, it was simultaneously, simultaneously exciting, but at the same hand, like, you know. I sure hope it fits the Disney style because I was always the type of person who who pushed things a little on the edge, probably for the Disney company. Uh, my stuff was never cutesy. It was never horrific. But on the same hand, it was edgy. And uh, I've always liked what I call realistic fantasy. You know, it's like, it's fantasy and you can tell, but it's like, Hmm. I could almost see this actually happening. I kind of believe this. I believe this story. I can I can immerse myself into it. So that's the first part of this story. And we're going to go on with it as to what transpires. But I wanted to kind of share with you the beginnings of this. My experience as an Imagineer. And I'm going to be bluntly honest. I'm not going to name names sometimes. Um, I'm going to tell you who inspired me. I'm going to tell you who... made me lose some of the magic, the expectations. And I'm not, I'm not going to name them by name, but I'm going to be very, very honest with you as I experienced it so that if there's anyone out there that's just very curious about what it's like to become an Imagineer or someone who aspires to be one, um, this was my experience. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy episodes that follow. <laughs>